everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Controlling Pharmaceutical Powders, Confidence with Every Breath. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by LabConco. To learn more, visit labconco.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Jordan Henderson, Product Manager, LabConco Corporation, and David Wasesha, Director of Biosafety and Containment Products, LabConco Corporation. Jordan and David, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks for the introduction. Today we're going to spend some time talking about different ways to control pharmaceutical powders in laboratory and production settings. Jordan Henderson and I will be talking about uh, different types of enclosures, different ways to analyze risks, and how you can implement these processes and pieces of equipment to have a safer, more robust powder containment protocol for your laboratory. Today we're going to talk about a couple of key parts of assessing and integrating any type of powder containment device into your laboratory practices. And we'll start by looking at risks of pharmaceutical powders, um, characteristics and things that make them hazardous to human health. We'll also spend some time categorizing risks based on exposure limits, talking about OELs and OEBs. And later we'll talk about evaluating containment technologies, you know, the different types of enclosures and isolators that are available, and also ways that you can become an advocate for potent compound safety, both for your own practices and for your laboratory and greater manufacturing environment. Pharmaceutical powders uh, come in many different formats, and, and generally they're referred to as active pharmaceutical ingredients, or APIs. That's the, the part of the, the drug delivery load that is actively uh, the chemical of interest. That's a therapeutic. And uh, that's usually uh, paired together with excipients and other uh, combinations of powders and particulates to make the whole product. APIs, uh, before they're formed into a final product, are typically crushed, ground, or milled along the way from synthesis into their final form. And during uh, the process of creating these, these different types of uh, particulates, uh, there are risks involved with manipulating and, and changing the states of those, those particulates. Uh, powders are, are convenient for a lot of medicinal reasons, and one of those being uh, the, the fine grinding produces a high surface area and a lot of uh, uh, you know, highly bioavailable particulate for uh, the human body to absorb and make use of. And that allows for the human body to greatly reduce the amount of drug that needs to be administered for a therapeutic effect. Uh, also increases the potency of that drug. And uh, so um, with that comes some risks at times. When uh, pharmaceutical powders are ground, uh, one of the goals is to achieve a uniform size, which helps with that bioavailability and consistency for dosage later on in the process. Uh, in R&D settings, it also promotes uh, consistent laboratory results by avoiding things like clumps or, or chunks of, of sample that uh, do not readily dissolve or potentially don't uh, get analyzed properly due to those clumps. And uh, all of these um, uh, API powders are, are precursors to final forms. So, a lot of research and even into production sites, powders are often handled due to their, uh, you know, their, their uh, flexibility and how they can be packaged and stored and moved along from R&D to production. And eventually they will become finalized drug products, uh, whether it be you know, pressed into a tablet, uh, filled into a capsule, uh, sometimes blended into creams or ointments, dissolved into injectable drugs, 
or even sometimes left in a powder state, uh, such as in a lyophilized vial. Now, in powder form, drugs propose, uh, pose a, a significant risk to users because of their small size and ability to um, um, penetrate different parts of the body that uh, lead to high-risk areas. So well, one of the most risky spots that a user can be exposed to powders is through the airway. That's because the human body is actively pulling air into its body and forcibly removing aerosols from the environment around the human. In that sense, you're exposing uh, the human body, if left unprotected, uh, to APIs in surfaces like mucous membranes, uh, exposed to the inner skin on the body and down into the lungs, where drug absorption can be rapid with high potency and, and high effect. Other surfaces if left uh, exposed, such as skin and eyes on the exterior of the human body, are also subject to exposure risks and in doing so, being exposed, um, uh, users are, are potentially uh, going to reach a, a point where they can be harmed by APIs that they may be handling, especially if they're particularly potent. Drugs recently, speaking of potency, have become quite a bit more, um, more uh, potent, which means that uh, pharmaceutical companies can achieve a standard where less is more, where, where a sick patient or, or someone seeking a therapeutic effect can take less of a drug, get more of a therapeutic impact, and as a result, uh, have less has less foreign material going into the body. And this is really attractive because not only does it uh, save costs in manufacturing because less drug is needed to create the same effect, but for human health, it's always better to administer as least amount of drug as possible uh, to preserve other portions of the body should a drug have side effects or other unwanted uh, characteristics. A great example of this would be something like an antibody drug conjugate, or ADC. These are extremely potent drugs, typically, where an antibody and a drug are bound together, uh, where little amount of a drug is hitching a ride on an antibody to a therapeutic uh, site of interest within a body. And these drugs are incredibly potent and incredibly effective. They avoid side effects in many ways, uh, but pose risks to those handling those products along the way. Another thing to consider with potency and, and active pharmaceutical ingredients is that uh, while in high volumes they can be easy to see, uh, the small granules and, and powders can easily aerosolize. And to a user with, um, uh, with normal vision, it's can, it can be quite difficult to see how the powders may be dispersed in an area that they're uh, working in. And in fact, the users uh, with good 2020 vision have a difficulty seeing any kind of concentration of powder in the air more than 100 milligrams per, or, I'm sorry, less than 100 milligrams per cubic meter in the air. So as a result, um, oftentimes uh, people can be working with potent drugs that have an OEL or operational exposure limit well below this value and not know that they're being actively exposed to those drugs. So as David previously mentioned, that occupational exposure limits, or OELs, are really just classifications uh, and ways to assess certain levels of risk when it comes to handling hazardous or, potent, or, or highly potent powders. Um, again, these OELs are just basic guidelines that really just ensure workers that are um, not exposed to hazardous levels of whatever substance that they're potentially using. Now, OELs consist of a variety of parameters. Uh, some of those include permissible exposure limits, and that comes from OSHA, the recommended exposure limit uh, that comes from the NIOSH, uh, indicative uh, limit values, that's from the EU, and then the threshold limit values, which comes from the ACGIH as well. Um, now, really all of those particular um, parameters really are just uh, used for incident level exposures, one-time kind of exposures to really hazardous powders. Um, there's also um, another parameter that it, when it pertains to OELs uh, known as the time-weighted average, uh, and, and that value consists of the concentration of a hazardous uh, powder uh, or something, substance in the air uh, averaged over an eight-hour eight day uh, during a 40-hour work week, um, because oftentimes these processes 
uh, being carried out with these hazardous powders are, are done by real workers working eight-hour shifts five days a week. Uh, it's important to really establish um, really kind of any potential hazardous um, exposure limit uh, in that context as well and not just a single in incidence. Um, um, in conjunction with OELs, um, we have occupational ex exposure bans or OEDs as well. Um, while OELs are more or less um, standardized um, risk assessments for certain compounds, OEDs uh, are going to be a mechanism uh, that is used to assign to those hazardous co uh, chemicals or compounds uh, that kind of quantifies their toxicities uh, on a site-to-site -site basis. Um, this is a simplified tool um, that is used to classify that wide range of APIs, um, as previously mentioned, within an organization. Uh, and it's really kind of an integral part of the um, uh, risk assessment and risk management process um, that is being carried out on a daily basis uh, when handling hazardous uh, APIs or other compounds. Um, for the most part, uh, it generally follows just a lettering or number system. Um, OEB1 or OEBA levels uh, tend to be, uh, I'm sorry, tend to be um, less hazardous uh, while going up all the way to uh, potentially a OEB level E or OEB level 5, which would be the most hazardous um, uh, to a potential workplace exposure. Uh, general guide, uh, guidance when it comes to those bands, again, um, bands vary from organization to organization, and that's going to be dependent on a variety of factors based on kind of the engineering controls that are set, uh, that are put in place uh, for that site to protect those workers from potential exposures. Uh, and really kind of the components that uh, make up um, kind of that OEB banding are going to be uh, listed here. So carcinogenicity, um, uh, ter teratogenicity, uh, reproductive toxicity, uh, genotoxicity, um, kind of any uh, organ toxicity, even at low, I mean, especially at low doses, uh, and then uh, drugs specifically that mimic existing drugs. And really what's important about this is that a drug that is structurally similar can therefore have similar properties uh, to a known OEB or a known OEL. So we can kind of have a, a really kind of just a, a good jumping off point to put in place certain engineering measures to, again, make sure workers are protected when handling these substances. As Jordan mentioned with OEBs and OELs, they're a great way to look at hard data on OELs and then establish a, a, a general guidance for an organization. But OELs on their own and OEBs on their own are not enough to establish all considerations that a laboratory needs to implement when bringing a process into their laboratory. The OELs establish how much a person can be exposed to, and OEBs put that into a, a, a grouping. But there are processes that have an, an inherent risks that go beyond uh, what might be expected to happen during a normal day, and, and activities that uh, oftentimes happen with handling of APIs on the R&D side involve tasks like weighing, uh, both small and large volumes, uh, milling, actively grinding powders, whether to reduce chunks or to achieve a consistency in, in the, the size of particulates in a, in a sample. Also, tools like characterization, so using a malware master size or particle sizing instrument or assessing purity are also manipulations that can take place with powders. Uh, on the R&D side, those are all things that can happen on very small scales, you know, uh, microgram scales to uh, kilo scale. And it's important to consider all of the risks that may happen. You know, is my vessel at risk for tipping over and overcoming the engineering control I'm working inside of? or um, is it maybe just a small sample and there's very low risk? So those are factors that need to go into the risk assessment associated with an OEB and toxicity level for a compound. Now on the manufacturing side, uh, processes can go from very small volumes to very large volumes and at times exceed 100 kilos. And in such a process, it's really important to look at the entire line of work, uh, materials transfers and other factors that exchange 
part, particulates and potency compounds where users can be exposed in ways that may not be most obvious um, when installing, installing the equipment used for manufacturing. The easiest way to assess a risk, quantify it, and get a best level of opinion is to consult an industrial hygienist, whether it's someone from your company and your organization's EHS department, or if it's an outside source. And uh, this process is going to look at, you know, um, if, if the OELs are known or if not, looking at similar drug data to understand at least a baseline level of potency, followed by potentially implementing surrogate powder studies where you actually replicate the processes to be carried out in the laboratory or manufacturing environment by using a less potent uh, compound, usually something that's completely non-hazardous to users, uh, like a sugar or an approximate sodium. Now, uh, once this is done, those are factors that can all go together to establish a general OED level, and that is a way to harmonize the general level of, of safety or expectation for a, a company on how they will handle a certain process and a certain volume of, of compound. But it does not uh, go without saying that it's still critical for a user to focus on daily activities that present risks not necessarily uh, quantifiable by that risk assessment uh, process. So moving on to ways to manage containment, we understand that there are ways to quantify the potency of a drug. And the way that users can manipulate these workflows safely is by using engineering controls that generally are going to provide some kind of negative pressure containment. Now, in this picture, you see a, 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 a ventilated balance enclosure drawing air away from the face opening. That is a visualization of smoke representing negative pressure airflow from the front to the back of the enclosure away from the user. In these designs, ventilated balance enclosures or open systems are going to use as low airflow as possible to avoid turbulence, which promotes uh, uh, not only containment properties by avoiding turbulent air and, and mixing and swirling of particulates that have aerosolized, but it can also help with processes that are sensitive, such as weighing on an analytical balance or a microbalance. Engineering controls that are used for powder containment also need to be highly cleanable. Uh, many times these devices are used for uh, many different types of batches, not only of the same compound uh, of different weights, but of different types of compounds, um, sometimes hundreds or thousands of compounds within one of these enclosures over its lifetime. So being able to fully de decontaminate the, the enclosure is critical to its ability to work properly, not only in containment, but also to avoid cross-contamination of sensitive samples and materials that may be handled in the enclosure. These designs of these enclosures also combine airflow with HEPA filtration, so that's high efficiency particulate air filtration. And that particulate that is being generated in the powder form of an API needs to be captured on some kind of filter before airflow going through the enclosure is exhausted either back into the environment of the laboratory or out through the building. And these, in, these enclosures and engineering controls are most commonly found in two formats. I mentioned the ventilated balance enclosures, which are open systems as described in the image here. But they also include a wide variety of containment isolators that are sealed systems, which promote uh, a, a higher level of containment than even an open system, working with great efficient containment airflow. So to piggyback on what Dave was uh, explaining about uh, bag-in, bag-out HEPA filtration, uh, what this actually does is this engineering control actually allows for a, an additional complete barrier when changing out those saturated HEPA filters from uh, potentially exposing not only the workers but that uh, environment that that worker's in uh, to those hazardous APIs or powders. Uh, this is uh, commonly found um, just in biocontainment lab exhaust but it should be found throughout uh, really kind of the entire workflow that these people are using uh, these hazardous powders or ATIs in. Um, ideally, uh, when it comes to pharmaceutical, um, these things are just ubiquitous throughout the entire process, so um, definitely important there. Now, other engineering controls uh, that are commonly 
um, used to really ensure user safety or worker safety from potential exposures are going to be ergonomics. So ergonomics is important because worker comfort is insanely important to uh, preventing spills and, again, increasing the risk of potential exposures for those hazardous APIs. Um, also, it's important to validate containment for any uh, v VBEs or isolators that are being used to prevent uh, or provide that physical barrier uh, between that workflow and then, then, then that workflow that is handling that hazardous API. Um, as Dave mentioned previously, it's uh, generally with a, a, a powder. Uh, for the most part, sodium nephroxin is generally used to do this. You can also use lactose. Um, and this can be done um, either by a third party uh, consultant. Uh, we commonly use Trinity. It used to be known as SafeBridge uh, to perform these tests in a third party capacity. Uh, but it's also uh, worth mentioning that. Um, Oftentimes, can, these can be done in-house just to reconfirm uh, containment of whatever piece of equipment uh, that you're implementing uh, to uh, achieve that engineering control. Um, also worth mentioning that uh, when it comes to those open air uh, filtration systems, uh, ASHRAE 110 comes in. Uh, sometimes uh, it's common practice to measure out a small sample of a pharmaceutical API or hazardous powder and then load them into a chemical solvent. Uh, so being able to direct uh, chemical vapors away from uh, end users is just as important as being able to contain and direct uh, uh, hazardous powder uh, away from a user as well. Speaking of chemical vapors, it's important to recognize a separation between potent compound uh, containment vessels and, and enclosures such as VBEs and isolators and, and differentiate them from chemical fumes. Chemical fumes are ubiquitous with all chemistry laboratories and widely found throughout pharmaceutical environments, but they should never be used with any kind of potent compound of any sort. And that is because they do, primarily because they do not contain any kind of exhaust HEPA or ultra filtration to stop particulates from being ejected outside of the exhaust system. So, in most VBEs and isolators, a HEPA filter is built right into the enclosure to capture that hazardous API directly within the enclosure so that it can prevent containment of any ductwork or contamination of any ductwork and also be easily removed by a technician. If you were to use an API that is hazardous in a fume hood, you have the entire exhaust pathway that would be contaminated and difficult to decontaminate. And you're also risking ejection of hazardous particulates out onto the top of the building and into the surrounding environment. Unlike a chemical vapor from a, a you know, solvent, chemical powders do not dissipate and disperse. So they remain as equally potent as they are in the laboratory as they would outside the laboratory. Another critical component of fume hoods that is not helpful for most API handling is that they typically run at higher phase velocities. Now, over the last several years, fume hoods have become much more effective at running safely at lower phase velocities, but oftentimes EHNS and organizations choose to run them at 80 to 100 feet per minute or sometimes even faster, which poses inherent risks um, to both the process and to the safety of the user. And primarily the two most common disruptions are to balance stability, primarily if you are working with an open top loader balance, or also if you are working with a highly potent API, that turbulent air can cause non-uniform airflow through the face of the cabinet or fume hood, and as a result can cause turbulence that would bring powders out of the hood if airflow is too fast. So there are methods to establish what type of uh, engineering control should be selected. And fortunately, a, a good reference is looking at the OEV banding levels of a, any given API. Now, these are, again, OEVs are established by each organization depending on their comfort level and the, the process and the OEL of a known um, substance. And generally speaking, uh, Containment for val ventilated balance enclosures that, that is of the highest levels 
would be suitable for most activities uh, involving OEB 1 through 4 uh, compounds. Now, OEB 1 through 3 uh, very easily worked on in a ventilated balance enclosure. OEB 4 should really be evaluated carefully to assess the amount of energy involved in the process to see if it would exceed the containment abilities of the balance enclosure. For compounds that are OEB 4 or 5, typically an isolator is used uh, because they are sealed vessels that uh, promote a, a more robust containment that can't be defeated by accidents or inadvertent processes that happen while handling APIs. So in all of these factors, again, it's important to look at not only the OEB, but uh, the, the process that is happening with that API. And so you have to look at and consider, is the activity low or high energy? So to say, am I scooping a small volume of powder just carefully, as the gentleman in the top image is doing? Or am I actively grinding and using an automated instrument that is going to create a lot of aerosol that is a higher energy and harder to contain? Also need to consider equipment space requirements. So if you are using um, a particle, particle sizer or a large instrument that's blocking a lot of the space within an enclosure, it may mean that airflow is disrupted through the, the balance enclosure, and as a result, you may need to either go to a customized solution that is for that instrument, or you may need to consider a fully sealed glove box that contains uh, just due to being sealed off from the outside environment. Another factor is, again, looking at sample size. So is it an analytical process, or are you handling bulk samples that maybe require, you know, drum manipulation devices to work safely, both not only for, um, uh, for containment, but also for um, protection of the user from undue inju injury during handling powders. And with that comes ergonomics and user comfort, because as Jordan uh, described earlier, those are factors that aren't, you know, a, a directly ad addressed with a, a balance enclosure or isolator, but are inherently there and promote comfortable, safe work that allows for less accidents and easier manipulation of powders without uh, uh, spillage. So ventilated balance enclosures, breaking them down a little bit more closely, you have typically a benchtop, um, task-specific configuration, usually meant for analytical weighing or uh, with some modifications can hold mills, tablet presses, or any number of instruments that would be used to manipulate or assess APIs. Balance enclosures have uh, grown and changed over the years, but primarily today, they come including a HEPA filter that's integral to the system along with a blower and recirculate air back into the room. And in certain cases, due to safety risk or use of chemicals, additional chemical vapors may be exhausted to the outside through a thimble or canopy connection, or they may be redundant exhausted through a second HEPA filter before returning either to the room or to the environment. During the use of a balance enclosure, um, you should really be assessing the types of work that are suitable for an open environment and um, helping with containment of those patterns that are going to be used, you know, scooping out of containers and put on the balances or smaller processes. Helping those stay in the hood are things like airfoils that allow for a lower airflow velocity or face velocity into the hood that promotes balance stability but also helps, uh, you know, the other factors that are important are a zoned rear baffle that directs air all the way to the back of the hood. And um, in addition to this, you really want to make sure that you're using a design that limits batch to batch contamination. So as mentioned earlier, ensuring that the hood is fully cleanable, that important critical pieces like the baffle can be brought down for full cleaning as necessary. And as mentioned previously, again, these are typically suitable for OEB 1 through 3 and some processes of OEB 4, depending on how high energy or how large the process is happening. As mentioned previously, another key factor is really focusing on, on the construction of these devices. And while, while simple hoods sitting on the bench top, they can play a key factor into the, the, the consistency of the products that you are handling. and and that includes making sure that you can decontaminate the system. So selecting an enclosure that's made out of metal and glass versus plastic will ensure that the surfaces are easy to wipe and clean and will last for a long time. Um, 
Again, minimal seams help with a uh, clear wiping. So uh, if you look at the enclosure pictured here, you've got lots of spaces that can be wiped easily or removed and disassembled for a more terminal clean as necessary. Now, there's also key factors in the construction that promote easier weighing. Uh, glass is anti-static and, and, and static dissipative, and that helps especially with lyophilized powders or things that are harder to weigh just due to staticky characteristics of the powders. And you also want to look for something that's vibration isolating because uh, some balances, although many have quite great, uh, drastically improved over the years, some balances still struggle with vibration issues. Now, uh, additionally in the hood, you want to, uh, being a safety product, you want a way to always manipulate and monitor the airflow. Uh, setting the device to measure when airflow goes too low and notifying a user. That's a key factor that should be on every balance enclosure. Also, you want some kind of device to measure when the HEPA filter is loaded. So typically a differential pressure gauge of some sort is used. Uh, more modern systems are beginning to use blower controls that assess the actual filter loading and do so much more accurately. And lastly, you want to make sure that you've got um, a flexibility for uh, characteristics that support work inside the hood. That's uh, cord pass-throughs and things like waste chutes to handle excess consumable waste during any processes. And lastly, when you're working with chemical solvents, you also want to make sure that your enclosure is compatible with exhaust uh, right alongside your fumes and other products within your laboratory. In some instances, processes exceed small volumes, and uh, typically in the kilo scale, pilot scale, um, to other processes that go into manufacturing, you may wind up handling barrels of all different sizes. And in these processes, selecting a balance enclosure that's designed to safely handle a barrel is really important to make sure that users aren't inadvertently opening the barrel in an uncontained, uh, uncontained environment. So oftentimes you see these in environments where QC sampling is done or sometimes large volumes are being dispensed from barrels. And uh, doing this in an integrated large bulk powder balance enclosure is going to help contain that whole process. Now, many times people also seek out downflow booths to work with barrels, and while they can provide greater accessibility to barrels by not having a containment hood uh, to, to work within, it also means that users are directly exposed to the environment where the weighing and manipulation processes are happen happening, and as a result, have to wear a lot more PPE and be mindful of the processes that they're conducting. So it's always important to look at a risk analysis. Um, you know, is the barrel you know, suitable for a VBE or does it need to be in a larger environment just based on what's going to happen with the barrel manipulation? And in many cases, if you can keep it to a hood, it's going to ensure long-term safety uh, for users without the, the, the burden of a large downflow booth installation. So as David mentioned previously, that VBEs are going to be um, pretty essential for carrying out OEB level one through three, um, handling of uh, hazardous powders, uh, and potentially for some uh, OEB level four hazardous powders. Uh, containment isolators are gonna be your go-to piece of equipment uh, to handle OEB level four and five hazardous powders. Um, again, uh, containment isolators not only are perfect for handling those extremely potent APIs, but it's also a perfect environment to contain a high energy process like um, grinding or, meal, uh, or milling. Uh, the reason why this is perfect is because it actually presents itself as a physical barrier between uh, an end user or a worker and whatever process they're carrying out. Um, generally, these uh, the containment isolators have a class one leak rate per, per ISO 10648-2. And generally speaking, the way these pieces of equipment operate is that they leverage a blower which generate negative pressure which draws in room air through a, a inlet HEPA or OPA filter. Uh, and then that blower then pushes that air through an exhaust, or sorry, not an exhaust, but an outlet uh, HEPA or OPA filter, uh, which is then can then dump that air back into that room or we can go ahead and use a canopy or ductwork connection uh, to exhaust that room uh, to the external environment. Uh, again, just to reiterate, like I said before, uh, these containment isolators can come either with HEPA uh, or OPA filtration, and that's really going to uh, provide up to an ISO class 3 uh, clean room standard. Uh, 
Oftentimes, again, because these things contain filters and we're trapping hazardous particulates or uh, pharmaceutical APIs, uh, those filters are going to uh, need to be replaced periodically, and uh, we can go ahead and provide an additional level of protection or an engineering control of that bag-in, bag-out system uh, to protect uh, workers or, or people changing out those filters from potential exposures to those ha hazardous APIs. Um, when it comes to really kind of the design characteristics of containment isolators, um, it is very task oriented. We have a, a work surface that's contained, so we can do, again, those high energy processes, so milling and grinding, of course. Um, really kind of what lends itself to that of the liner construction. So as David mentioned uh, previously, that cleanability is a very, very important uh, component of uh, uh, engineering control. A, a very important component of uh, containment isolators. And, and as far as engineering controls, uh, oftentimes the stainless steel liner in these uh, have rolled corners. So again, it makes it easier to clean any residual powders from any weighing, uh, grinding, milling, potential spillage uh, that happens inside the box. Um, generally, these um, liners are 300 uh, series stainless steel, but also uh, we do have the ability to um, swap that out for a more chemically resistant uh, fiberglass liner. Uh, when it comes to the blower and doing really any analytical or sensitive uh, weighing techniques, uh, it's important to really isolate that blower to reduce vibrations as much as, much as possible. Uh, again, vibration is just going to uh, add to inaccuracy when it comes to weighing, uh, so it's very important to do that. Um, oftentimes when you're placing pieces of equipment in these enclosures, in, into these isolators, uh, having the ability to add pass-throughs and other ports is is paramount. Uh, supplying supplying uh, electric electricity to the units and then getting information out of um, uh, the enclosure um, that's contained, let's just say, an analytical balance uh, is important for um, uh, document tracking and record keeping and, and other quality assurance measures. Uh, Again, when it comes to leveraging uh, these containment isolators, it we cannot be understated that the importance of uh, getting uh, the containment capabilities verified uh, by a third party uh, is re highly recommended. Uh, again, uh, Trinity, formerly known as SafeBridge uh, Consultant, can do that as a third party, um, but um, these uh, containment verification procedures can be done in-house. Um, uh, using, leveraging those surrogate powder testing, so again, sodium naproxen or, or lactose. So we've reviewed the different types of enclosures that can be selected to handle different types of bands, and it's a, a critical to remember that when you're selecting one of these enclosures for laboratory or manufacturing process, you consider more than just those data points that suggest its potency level. There's a lot of factors that go into ensuring that the process is safe, and that includes just evaluating not only that potency, but how the powder is going to be manipulated, who's going to be using it, the processes involved, uh, everything down to simply the ergonomics of interacting with the powder can all play a key uh, role in the user's safety. So in all cases, it's important to select an enclosure that's robust and, and can be validated, either if that's from the manufacturer itself we're also done uh, locally on, on site after installation. And, and really, that is the, the key gold standard of, of validating the safety of a process is to replicate it to a T. So in that sense, that's a great opportunity to get in touch with your industrial hygienist on site or a third-party industrial hygienist. Utilize your EHNS office for any and all data to assess risks for yourself. And work with equipment manufacturers not only to select you know the the, the off-the-shelf equipment but to look for solutions that promote safety when using uh, more unique instruments and devices to accomplish your unique tasks so with that we're going to turn it over to questions at this time and thank you so much again for joining and we um, hope to share a little bit of our information with you as um, the next question session begins Thank you, David and Jordan, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now.
Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, does LabConco provide any custom designed options? We have a requirement to contain an instrument used with OEB4 powders. That's a great question. Um, many times when you're looking at products offered for powder containment, they can appear, you know, just like standard formats, you know, looking like standard hoods or isolators. Um, but if you have a unique process, it's definitely something that you want to bring up during the equipment selection phase. And uh, if required, uh, the, the designs of some of our enclosures can definitely be modified, whether that's, you know, an instrument that needs to be housed inside, like the question is asking, um, you know, and, and where the ergonomic access point needs to be within the hood that can be altered. Um, or if you have, you know, pass-throughs or other unique requirements that aren't on the standard formats, those are things that are easily accommodated through a little bit of design work on our end and definitely can influence and make the, the process of using that enclosure safer and more ergonomic. Good question. Great, thank you. Next question, can our fume hood be converted into a powder containment hood with a HEPA filter? Another good question. Um, the answer is it really depends. Um, fume hoods are traditionally designed to contain chemical vapors. And so uh, they're going to be best, you know, used for chemical processes, not so much API handling. Um, without any kind of protection in the ductwork, like a HEPA filter, the, the hood is not a suitable choice for API handling. Um, in some cases, sometimes hoods, they, they are containment devices. Uh, they can be retrofitted with a bag in bag out HEPA filter in the exhaust pathway. It's usually less favorable though than uh, a true dedicated powder containment enclosure like a VBE or an isolator because a portion of that ductwork is still going to be contaminated by hazardous APIs. And furthermore, that hood may not be actually tested and known to be a good containment device for powders. So it's always good to check in with the manufacturer of that product before using it for powder containment purposes. And if possible, and you know, proceeding with it as an API containment vessel to use a, a bit of industrial hygiene assessment first at a bare minimum. Thank you. Next question. Is there a good universal enclosure for OEB4 and OEB5 APIs? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, there sure is. So the best universal enclosure, for the most part, when handling OEB4 um, and 5 level APIs is going to be a containment isolator. Um, while a VBE can handle some uh, OEB level 4 APIs, um, if you want to be conservative when making your assessment on what type of enclosure, I would always recommend starting with a containment isolator. And that's really just because not only does it provide a physical barrier to separate end users from a workflow, um, it also uh, gives you a work area to do high energy um, practices or, or workflows like um, uh, grinding and milling as well, again, uh, just to add another level of protection uh, when it comes to separating uh, any inherent risk from handling these um, uh, hazardous uh, or potent compounds. So, yeah, good question. I might also add just realizing there are some models that are hybrid versions of a, of a VDE and an isolator. And while those up front can look like great options for flexible, you know, work between OEV 3 and 4 and 4 and 5 and 6 and above, uh, you have to be really careful about the parts that are used to you know, that pull in and out of that, that conversion between a glove box and a VDE. Uh, oftentimes it's difficult to fully decontaminate the inside of an isolator, um, or it, it's just challenging for users to see all powders and fully decontaminate. So while those are out there, they have to be really cautious about implementing those. Thank you. Why is bag in, bag out vital to protecting workers from potential hazardous exposure? Well, bag in, bag out is just so important because, again, when it comes to changing out saturated filters, so either HEPA or ULTA, uh, we still need a physical barrier um, to not expose any um, not captured particulate matter uh, in those filters. And so really, especially with any low-dose hazardous powders, um, 
you there's an inherent risk of potential exposure when changing out those. So again, uh, physical barrier is key when it um, when discussing bag in bag out. Uh, and it, and again, it's just another safety measure or engineering control uh, that's commonplace and, and, and a requirement when it comes to protecting workers uh, handling hazardous powders or uh, pharmaceutical APIs. So good question. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like that's all that we have time for today. Thank you, David and Jordan. Do you have any final comments for our audience? At this time, just thankful for all of your time today and yes. we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Absolutely. I agree. Great. Well, thank you, David and Jordan, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, LabConco, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>